Let's do this right now. We call our lives synchronized with your perfect will, Father. Father, we just thank you for helping us. God, we're getting into this new season and we believe we need your help. We want your help and we ask for it. In the name of Jesus, we know that Jesus has the precious Holy Spirit on assignment to help us. So we receive that help right now. We appropriate all the benefits of his help, his teaching, his instruction, unfolding of the word of God in our lives. We believe we receive it in Jesus' name. Say that again. I believe that my life is synchronized with God's perfect will right now. You speak that out. Even as I'm preaching this message, you speak that out into your life and into your heart. You know what? We're going to start part one of don't give up. Don't give up. What a way to start the day, right? God Almighty has a message for you as you step into this new season. He's saying, don't give up. You may feel like you're at the end of your rope, so to speak, or you may not even be conscious that you've already given up. Like Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, it says that people without a vision, they perish. It says they cast off restraint. They just give up. Have you just cast off restraint? Then you've probably let go of hope and given up, at least in some area in your life. God's saying right now to you, he's saying, don't give up. Don't give up. Some are fully aware that they've lost hope. Others have been like the analogy of the frog in the pot of water, slowly boiling to death and not even conscious of their condition. Have you turned off all care for your dreams, for your marriage, for your family? Maybe you've stopped any discipline with what you eat or even drink. You just don't care anymore. Places where you used to try to, now you don't even care because you've lost the vision or where you're going. You're, you've secretly hopeless and now you're just quietly casting off all restraint. If one painkiller makes you feel okay, then why not two? Why not three? Guess what? God is whispering to you right now. He's saying, don't you give up. I love you. Don't give up. I'm the resurrection and the life. My friend, he's saying, don't give up. God is wanting to turn your sorrow into joy, your mourning into dancing, give you beauty for the dust and the ashes that you feel like you're surrounded by. Don't be condemned at this moment. Don't let criticism come up on the inside of you. Let go of it and just listen. Pay attention to what the Lord Almighty is saying to you right now. You've listened to the voice of condemnation and judgment far too long, says God. Stop it. Open up your heart to his word right now and let the light of his holy vision dominate the atmosphere in your life. God has unfailing hope for you. He is the dream resurrector and the one, the only one able to bring what's dead to life. He is the resurrection and the life. You may feel like the loser of all losers, but God is working even in your darkness right now. He's able to build character into you to transform your life. He is the expert at seeing possibilities where there is nothing that appears of any good or any value or any use. He can make a leader, an influencer out of you, my friend, for good, for life. Dr. Miles Monroe, the late Dr. Miles Monroe, amazing teacher, he once said this. He said, great leadership is not attained by pursuing greatness, but by persevering through great tests. Don't give up, my friend, but push through with God's help. Get his word and push on through. You're feeling tempted to give up right now because the enemy... I'm telling you, the enemy is terrified of you pushing through to the other side. He's terrified of where you're going. He's afraid of what you'll discover that God has for you. Look what God's word says about your situation right now, because this is your true source of help and hope. Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 12. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, that means empty, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Verse 12, for you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. God is building something in you right now, and it's not an uncomplicated, temporary thing. It's an eternal, beautiful story, a beautiful testimony. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. He says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God goes on to say that the rain comes down. Does that seem a little too obvious for us? But what he says is, for us to notice that the basic principle that something comes down to push something good up. It's a cycle as old as the earth. It's right in front of us. And yet we try to compete with God's ways and his thoughts by thinking that we've got a superior idea. And then God goes on to say, listen to this. So shall my words be coming out of my mouth, God says. It shall not return to me void or empty. It shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. What's the end product? Then you shall go out with joy, God said, and you will be led forth with peace. Woo, man, that's beautiful. It was the early 1960s in Birmingham, Alabama. Dr. Martin Luther King was given a speech when a 200 pound white man named Roy James charged the stage and began punching, pummeling Dr. King with his fists. Quickly, King's aides rushed to defend him from the 24-year-old attacker. A journalist was there and later wrote that everyone was amazed to watch Dr. King become the assailant's protector. He held the young man with concerning care as the audience began to sing. He told Roy that their cause was just. Violence was self-demeaning. He then introduced Roy James to the crowd as though he were a surprise guest the young man who lived in the American Nazi Party dormitory there in Arlington, Virginia, he began to weep in Dr. King's embrace. Can you just see this picture, this beautiful picture? The world needs to see this picture. This was not just a social justice thing. This was a born again child of God triumphing with God's love in the face of adversity. Martin Luther King would not let go of his vision for unity, peace, justice, even under attack. He was an expert at not giving up. The man famous for the line, I have a dream, succeeded using God's love and a don't give up attitude. That's the God kind of thinking and it's for you and me. It's for you and I to employ this. Now it's time to look up, not give up. My mom used to tell me, she said, Stephen, get your chin up, get your chin up. You need to understand that the enemy, the devil is terrified of you persisting, overcoming. He can't manage your faith, your success, your breakthrough. He has no resistance against you. You're the one with the power to resist him. Look at James 4 verse 7. So be subject to God, Resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do I resist the devil when I hardly have an ounce of strength left to stand up any longer? Here's the key. You never are supposed to stand in your own strength. God sent Jesus so that we could stand firm in Christ, in his righteousness, in his strength, not any ability of our own. In fact, we get in deep spiritual trouble when we try to be independent of God. We become self-deceived thinking we're something more than we are. That's dangerous. Realize this very important fact. You're not alone. Everyone feels like giving up at some point in life. Nobody is immune from that temptation. No one. 
Everyone experiences discouragement, sadness, depression, disappointment, and hopelessness. Look at what Jesus, the Son of God, was feeling at a prayer meeting in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he was about to go to the cross. Look at Jesus, Matthew 26, verses 37 and 38. And taking with him, that's Jesus, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to show grief and distress of mind and was deeply depressed. Then Jesus said to them, My soul is very sad and deeply grieved so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and keep awake and keep watch with me. You want to talk about sorrow, sadness, grief, all stacked like a ton of bricks on the heart of Jesus? Even in his prayers that night, we hear him say, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus knew what it was like to be tempted with the voice of sadness, depression, sorrow, justification to take the easy road, to give up and just call it done. My grandfather, he really liked country music, especially funny ditties, humorous songs with, with a quirky hook. He was partial to vintage country. So when I was a boy, I remember him smiling and turning up the radio as we drove down the road when an old Johnny Cash song would come on like A Boy Named Sue or I've Been Everywhere, Man. He liked that kind of stuff. And one song I remember that he thought was hilarious, um, the words went something like this, gloom, despair, and agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Now, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Gramp would get the biggest grin on his face, and then he'd kind of nod at me as if to say, that's pretty good, huh? <laughs> but that's how some people are. They feed on the gloom and the despair and the agony on me. Of course, you're going to feel compelled to give up if your mental diet is excessive misery. David the psalmist, along with all of his men, had just got robbed by the Amalekites, but they didn't just take their stuff. You know, it's one thing to lose your stuff, but the Amalekites also, they stole their wives and their children to their families. They burned their homes and their town to the ground. Man, it was a discouraging discouraging mess. And it was so upsetting for every one of David's men that they began to seriously discuss, let's kill the boss. Let's kill the leader. Let's kill David. After all, everything goes back to the top, right? The leader gets the blame or the leader gets to give out the trophies. And in this case, David was getting all the blame. The guys were discouraged. Now look at how David handled this very, very difficult, hopeless situation. This is a hopeless situation when your friends turn against you. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed, for the men spoke of stoning him, because the souls of them all were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged and strengthened himself. How? In the Lord his God. No doubt he was greatly distressed, but you can't stay there. Even with your friends and your companions talking about stoning you dead, you've got to get God's perspective in on the situation because negative talk does nothing profitable, nothing for your life. In fact, once David started encouraging himself in the Lord, he got a plan from heaven on how to go after the enemy and so they would get everything, their wives, their children, plus damages, plus rewards, plus treasures restored to them in multiples. So he became so encouraged that he could easily persuade the guys to not kill him and instead obey his commands to go back into war. That's how encouraged David got himself, encouraging himself in the Lord. And so they did. They got all that the Lord said that they would. What was meant for evil, guess what? It turned for their good. And each of the guys became abundantly, supernaturally rewarded with the enemy's spoil. That's God's plan for your life. Here's a perfect thought to biblically encapsulate this don't give up mindset. Galatians 6 verse 9. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap 
if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. You will reap if, if you don't give up. Being courageous is not giving up. Mahalia Jackson was born in 1911 in New Orleans, Louisiana. She grew up in deep poverty when racial segregation was still pervasive throughout America. She became one of the most influential vocalists of the 20th century, performing all over the world and selling an estimated, get this, 22 million records. She openly gave God all the credit for lifting her off of the floors that she used to scrub on her knees up to success, saying, He can lift you up too. That's what she would tell folks. God can lift you up too. But she would always include the condition of having a made-up mind. She is quoted as having said, what do you want to be? Where do you want to go? God will lift you up. Then she would add this condition, you've got to have a made up mind. Imagine this coming from a woman with hardly any education who was breaking through every barrier of the day with unimaginable success and influence. Mahalia Jackson's story is not exclusive just to her. It's what can happen when you take a perfectly give up situation and with God's help, God's direction, you don't give up. John 10 verse 10. Jesus said this, he said, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. He said, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Mahalia Jackson could have taken her counsel from society around her on what a young black girl could or couldn't do in her day, but no, she took her counsel from God Almighty. God told her he would lift her up off that scrubbing floor and fulfill her dreams. Dreams very few people would ever even imagine to dream. Mahalia had a made up mind based on the word of God. Did she ever feel like giving up? I'm sure a million times over. But you don't give up when God is for you. Because Romans 8 verse 31 says, If God is for us, then who can be against us? But you can't quit on you. My friend, you can't quit on you. You can't quit on God. God can be there for you. But if you're against yourself, God doesn't have permission or authority to help you, to heal you, to save you. Isn't that right? Salvation isn't automatic. Jesus was talking about the devil in Mark chapter 3, verse 25, and he said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. But that principle goes for everything and everyone. Your dreams can't stand divided. Your family, your marriage, your very own identity, none of it can stand divided. You can't live the amazing, don't give up life with God being for you, but you being against you. You've got to get on God's side of the equation, His way of thinking. Look at this, every problem carries an opportunity. Here's another reason why you've got to stop thinking, give up thoughts. Every problem, every enemy, every challenge carries an opportunity, not just an opportunity either. An opportunity to involve God's power and wisdom here on earth and for God to be glorified in the heavenly turnaround. You've heard me say this before. Quit praying your mountains away until you've consulted with the Holy Spirit on if all that raw material can be of some use to your dreams. Don't forget, God used the evil done to Joseph to position him in Pharaoh's palace as a world leader. God took the tragic story of Rahab and converted it into a great victory for the nation of Israel. God took the years of alcoholism and drug abuse of my dad and turned it into a story of encouragement and deliverance from many addicts, alcoholics, hopeless people that God cares about in AA. Is it God's will for these bad things to happen? Of course not. But God is the expert on turning the curse into a blessing. He takes dirt and ash and turns it into something beautiful. He takes a burnt field and turns it into a field of dreams that feeds the world. It's built right into the nature, this resurrection, death to life principle. Look around you. God is the author of all life, blessing. And as we read in John 10.10, 10, He comes to give us life life 
and life more abundantly. Don't give up. Stanley Arnold, a famous business idea man known for groundbreaking marketing concepts, once said this. He said, every problem contains within itself the seeds of its own solution. Well, guess what? What Proverbs 16 verse 4 says, the Lord has made everything to accommodate itself and contribute to its own end and his own purpose. Even the wicked are fitted for their role for the day of calamity and evil. John Irving, he's considered one of the greatest storytellers of American literature today. He has written best-selling fictional novels like The World According to Garp. You've probably heard of that, maybe read it. And the Academy Award-winning screenplay, The Cider House Rules. Believe it or not, John Irving does not find writing easy or natural. He has severe dyslexia. In high school, he earned a solid C- in English. His SAT verbal score was in the bottom third of his class. He stayed in high school an extra year to earn enough credits just to graduate. It would take him two to three hours to process what his fellow students took less than an hour to read. He wasn't lazy or stupid. He just had to work harder than everybody else to meet the challenge. That's where John found his superpower. He has learned that he has the tenacity, the capacity, the willingness to struggle, to have patience, and finally master the challenge. See, it's not that dyslexia is a gift or a blessing, but overcoming introduces new thinking, better thinking, a breakthrough attitude, a don't give up attitude. Jesus came preaching this same message. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That means change your thinking because God's kingdom is here. You might say, well, how in the world can God use brokenness, hurt? How can evil people have a role in God's big plan? Well, for that very important question, let's turn back to God's word for a story that is one of the most amazing don't give up stories in the Bible. This is the story of King Jehoshaphat and the terrorist armies. This takes place in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now here's the background on this hopeless situation. A great fearsome army consisting of the Moabites and Ammonites. They came from beyond the Dead Sea to attack the country of Judah, God's people. Jehoshaphat was king of Judah and so he declared a fast throughout the country saying, we need to call on the Lord for help everybody. Jehoshaphat prays a prayer that reminds God of all of God's victories that he's done for his people in the past. Then he ended the prayer by saying, God, all of our eyes are upon you. It says that all the people with their children stood before the Lord just waiting for an answer. Then it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon a couple of the prophets, and this is what they said. It's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, and then I'll read verse 17. The Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. And then skipping to verse 17, you shall not need to fight in this battle. What? Let me say that again. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your positions, stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. But that wasn't the end of the instructions. The next day as they were waiting to get ready, King Jehoshaphat translated the specifics of what God wanted for an enemy attack strategy. They were to put the singers out in front of the army singing, God is good and his mercy endures forever. You got it. That's what they're going to be singing. God is good and his mercy endures forever. That was the big plan over and over, just praising God and singing to God. Are you kidding me? No, that was the different thinking, the God thinking plan. And look at what happened. Second Chronicles 20 verse 22. I love this verse. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the men of Amnon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were self-slaughtered. 
The enemy was killed, slaughtered, but that's not all. In verse 25, it says that when Judah came upon the already destroyed enemy army, that it took them three whole days to pick up all the spoils, three days of collecting all the wealth that the dead guys left behind. God turned what the enemy meant for evil into a wealth courier delivery service for his people. King Jehoshaphat could have just said, well, we're all gonna die, so we may as well give up. But no, instead he said, let's not give up, but let's call on God. Let's humble ourselves and pray. Let's not give up, but let's put all of our trust in God because you know what? We're his people. Well, guess what, my friend? You belong to God too. You're his people. As a child of God, you get all of his don't give up benefits too. Remember, Galatians 6 verse 9 says, Let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint and acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. Now some of you might say, but, but I haven't given my life to God. Up to this point, I, I've just been doing my own thing, going my own way. I'd like to be able to call on God, but I don't deserve that privilege. I know I've sinned. I've done things against God's standards that would be considered immoral. I don't like that. I'd like to have those don't give up benefits. I sure could use his help, but I'm pretty sure that I'm not his people. Well, you can be right now. John 3, 16 is just for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has no pleasure in you perishing or dying or giving up on life. That's why he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins, your sins, my sins. When you believe on Jesus, God gives you the right and the privilege of being his child adopted into his family. Oh, don't give up, my friend. Not when you're so close to God's breakthrough help don't give up. In the next session, I'm going to give you some simple principle tips on how to apply this don't give up message to your own life. Any child of God can use them and work them for the win in life. But first, let's take care of getting you into the family of God by accepting Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate don't give up expert. We all need him living on the inside of us because in him we live, we move, and we have our being. Pray this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe that you are the Son of God. I know that you died on the cross. You rose up from the grave. You're seated on the heavenly throne. Forgive me for all my sins. Help me not to give up. Help me to live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me your hope and your strength. In your name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.